All right, so in the next part of the lecture, we're now looking at the tragedy of the commons. Um, so what are the commons? The commons were really, as you know from um, the Harding article you read, a piece of land in um, villages in England um, that were, um, they could be used by everyone in the village to graze their sheep or cows. They could just bring them there and um, you bring the cows there and you could eat as much of the grass as it's there and everyone could do that. Now, why is this tragic? It's tragic is that um, it's, at the beginning, you're kind of like below the cap carrying capacity of the land. All the users benefit from the commons, everyone's cows can graze there and so on. But then the tragedy arises because that there's, for me, is an interest, uh, and I have an incentive to give, you know, put, give one of more of my sheep to put it to the commons because there is enough green grass there after all. Uh, and that won't hurt, one sheep doesn't hurt. Um, but then if more, when more users increase the use of the common, they become degraded. The grass is worse and worse and worse. Um, and the cost of that is incurred by everyone. So, because it's bad for everyone's sheep. Um, and um, eventually the land will be unable to support this activity anymore. So this really is a multi-person prisoner's dilemma. The tragedy arises through the depletion of the common land by each farmer adding another animal to graze. A single addition to that pasture won't deplete the resource. So each individual farmer therefore has an incentive to add another um, animal. And if the others have added sheep already, well, that's even more reason to add another sheep now because it's gonna get even worse later. So where it's completely useless, so it's better to graze your sheep now. So whatever the others do, it's best for me to add another sheep now. So adding sheep is going to be the dominant strategy of this um, game. But the combined actions for each farmer seeking what's best for themselves is an outcome that's worst for all. It would have been better for us to keep the numbers of sheep relatively low because now we're in a given situation where the, the, the land is so dried out and um, eaten up that uh, none of the sheep can, it, it's sort of dead and we can't, none of the sheep in, for now in the future can eat there anymore at all. Um, so we have a situation that's a multi-person multi prisoner's dilemma situation where what's best for everyone collectively is not what's best for each individual. And so each individual has a reason to defect, best to cooperate and agree to put only a certain number of sheep there, but each individual will have an incentive to not do their part and defect on that collaborative enterprise, uh, more sheep to it. Now, in a sense, that is a very old problem that philosophers have long recognized. Uh, for example, um, David Hume, so here's what Hume says, two neighbors may agree to drain a meadow which they possess in common because it is easy for them to know each other's mind. Each must perceive that the immediate consequences of his failing in his part is the abandoning of the whole project. But it's very difficult, indeed impossible, that a thousand people should agree in such an action being difficult for them to concern to concert so complicated a design and still more difficult for them to execute it while each seeks a pretext to free himself of the trouble and expense and would lay the whole burden on others so if you have just a few people then likely they can agree on <clears throat> the common action they can just like sign a contract but if you have a lot of people then um it's very easy for an individual to decide, I'm going to free ride on the contributions that the others already engage. 
Okay, so what is so interesting about this? And this is something that I want to mostly leave to you and we'll take up in discussion. And I want every one of you to think about. So what's interesting about this is once you start thinking about prisoners' dilemmas and collective action problems, you see them absolutely everywhere. And a lot of the problems, uh, of the biggest problems of our society, of our time, are exactly collective action problems and have a prisoner dilemma sort of structure. Harding uses the example of overpopulation. More talk. I, 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 I won't talk so much about this here. Here's some other examples. Water pollution. Okay. If each of us, we have a common pool of resources, the water on our planet, each of us adds for, for it for, and we say no, that using plastic is going to end up in that, um, in the water. Okay. But for each individual, it seems like if I, for example, shower with a plastic bottle as opposed to bar soap, okay, um, how much of a, it feels a little bit, it's nicer to, it has better smell, the plastic bottle, it's, it's better, it's more comfortable, and it's not so soggy as this bar soap. Um, I have an, in, an interest to, um, to just um, use the plastic bottle. I know that the plastic is gonna end up in the water at some point, but given that everyone else is already using plastic bottles, I could just seems like add a little bit and I should do it now, um, just like with the sheep. Um, there's no, I have an individual interest, there's no real difference made by my uh, single bottle. And so the benefit, the, the pleasure I get from using the bottle outweighs the um, the um, um, the negative results. And so what's rational for, for an individual would be to keep using plastic and add to the uh, pollution of the water, the oceans. Um, um, but so we're gonna end up in a result where we all defect um, and use the plastic and so on. Um, because it's individually rational for us to do that, but what's collectively, what we should collectively do is something different. Okay. Climate change, greenhouse gases, another example. Okay. Big, big, big example. Um, how much difference would it make if I fly um, to vacation or if I fly to visit friends? Uh, how much difference can that make? Um, it doesn't make much of a difference if everyone else is doing the part and doesn't fly, but everyone else is also, so it's a dominant strategy for me. Um, if everyone else is contributing their part, that is, is not flying, then it doesn't make much of a difference if I fly. If no one else is contributing anything, then it also will not make a difference. And so it's again, um, I have an incentive to fly. It's a dominant strategy, the incentive to fly, whatever. So this is defect action because we're gonna end up destroying our climate, our planet. Same for destruction of, of wildlife, antibiotic resistance, a different case worth talking about. Um, it's, um, it's good to use antibiotics against um, diseases um, in hospitals and so on, because they do keep out the uh, bacterial infections. But if everyone keeps using antibiotics all the time, then we're going to end up in a situation where um, um, we're going to increase the probabilities of creating bac uh, bacteria that are antibiotic resistance. Vaccines and herd immunity, just uh, again, an example you don't see these days a lot. Um, if I if everyone else is already vaccinated, if everyone else is getting vaccinated, then there's no point for me getting vaccinated. It's just the pain of going to the vaccination station, the pain, uh, the, you know, even if slight, the, uh, the negative outcome of the vaccines are going to be um, a reason not to do it. But since, and I'm not needed, there's a incentive not to do it in this case. But if no one else is going to get vaccinated, then too, it seems like there's no point in getting me vaccinated because I'm, say, not very likely to get actually ill because I'm a pretty healthy, uh, young, so on person. And so 
um, there's no point of getting vaccinated either. So not getting vaccinated might turn out to be a dominant strategy. Okay. So collective action problems are everywhere. They have the style of multiple multi-person prisoners dilemma situations. The last part, we'll talk a little bit about how to solve them. 